And welcome into Press Box Live. I'm Stan Fan Charles from Press Box, PressBoxOnline.com. Gary Stein is with me as co-host. Gary, how are you? Doing great, Stanley. Ready for a big, uh, big interview with the big guy today. All right. The big guy in front of the flag is going to join us in just a second. As soon as I tell you that Press Box Live is brought to you by C3 American Exteriors. Go to their website at C3America.com and get a brand new roof for just the cost of your insurance deductible. Uh, joining us right now is an old friend, and I haven't had a chance to talk to him since he parted ways with Johns Hopkins University, and that is the former coach of Johns Hopkins University, Dave Petromala. Dave, how are you? First of all, happy new year, and uh, how are you feeling right now? Thanks, Stan. Great to see you and Gary. Uh, thanks for having me. Happy new year to you guys as well, and you know, given the circumstances uh, that we're all dealing with, I'm um, doing as well as can be expected. Thanks for asking. All right. Uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to you since since you left, parted ways with Johns Hopkins. Um, you know, I was looking at your record there, Johns Hopkins, and I was thinking back to something that Brian Billick used to say quite a bit, that he thought that the life expectancy of any coach in any sport should be about 10 years at one location. And I look at you and I looked at your career record and where did I put it? First, the first five years, you'd won a, a, a national championship. You went 63 and 10. The next uh, eight years, it looks like 75 and 35, 68% winning percentage. And then the last few years there, your winning percentage dropped to 68%, 66% or something like that. What happened to Dave Petromala at Hopkins? What changed about the incredible success in the first five and even the next seven or eight years compared to the last four or five of your coaching career there? Sure. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of the success that our staff had uh, with Seth Tierney there and then uh, – Obviously, Bob Benson and, and Bill Dwan was along for the ride the whole time. And then Tim Obransky joined us. Um, you know, I, I will say this. I, I think, you know, any time you're at one place that long, change, change is inevitable. Um, you know, change at the institution, uh, change in philosophy, uh, change in leadership, um, you know, change in styles. Um, you know, and, and I was at Johns Hopkins for uh, an awful long time, and I'm very grateful uh, to them for having me for that long. Um, you know, I, I look back and I look at a lot of these coaches that have stayed a long time. And like you're pointing out, it, it becomes challenging. Um, you know, and I think the greatest challenge we faced uh, as a staff was, was the decision to get involved with the early recruiting um, you know, we prided ourselves uh, in particular when we first arrived in, in you know, reestablishing a culture, um, you know, recruiting culture first, then talent. And I, I think we were fortunate enough in that 05 class to get a lot of both. And during that time period, you could really spend a good amount of time getting to know, um, you know, getting to know the young men and the families you were recruiting. The, the, the recruiting process was a much longer process. And as we went along, you know, things changed from recruiting juniors, then to sophomores, and then literally the freshmen that had never played a, a day on the varsity, probably. And uh, I think we made some mistakes there. Um, you know, I think, quite frankly, and that, and that happened, not to interrupt you, but that happened because so many more schools are attempting to get the, the best players, correct? That forced you to make decisions earlier. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I think we could have been a bit more courageous. And what I mean by that is I think we could have maybe decided not to get involved in the early recruiting so much and, and stuck to the, the formula that we had been so successful with. You know, the other thing, Stan, is, you know, the young men change. You know, and for me, uh, you know, the last six or seven months have been a great opportunity for me to self-reflect, look at the things that I did well. Uh, maybe look at some of the things I didn't do as well as I would like. Um, you know, and, and what I found is the game has changed so much. The head coach is, is doing so much more than ever before. And, and in a lot of places, the head coaches aren't coaching a side of the ball. They're coaching culture. 
they're dealing with development and alumni, you know, and, and if I'm fortunate enough to be at a next stop, uh, I think one of the things I, I, I believe I would like to do is have two coordinators, which I, I was the coordinator of the defense when I was at Hopkins, have two coordinators and let them do their job and, and, and have me focus on a, a lot of those other things. And, and you know, the old, the old saying is, you know, when you're doing so many things, I'm not sure you do anything well. Um, you know, I think I, I needed to focus my efforts, um, you know, a little bit in certain areas. So, you know, again, between the recruiting and, and now a bit of self-reflection, you, you look back and you say, wow, we did a lot of great things. And boy, did we have a great run there. Um, but we can all grow. We can all develop. And this has been an opportunity for me to, to do that and, uh, and figure out, you know, just how I'd like to handle the next stop. Before I give you over to Gary to ask you a couple of questions, I'm going to ask you one more question about Hopkins. At the very end, was it almost like a bad marriage where, uh, where it just was a relief when it was over? Or was it incredibly sad because of the fact that you are the only player that is ever, only person in lacrosse history to both play and win a championship at the same school? Yeah, you know, I, I don't have anything bad to say about Johns Hopkins, and I, I don't think I would classify it as a, a bad marriage. You know, I, I think, as I said, change is inevitable, you know, and, you know, you're there 20 years, you see a change in presidents, you see a couple of changes in athletic directors and administration, um, you know, and, and your, your ships at, at times just start to sail in, in a bit of different direction, and the way you see the, the right way of getting things done and achieving success may not be exactly the vision of, of, of that group. Um, but, you know, look, the folks at Johns Hopkins were, were great to me. Um, I, I, I am grateful and thankful. Um, you know, I don't know if it was sad. I think it's kind of a mixed bag of emotions. There are days where, you know, you miss it and you're, you're, you're sad. There are other days where you look at it and say, you know, this is a new opportunity to write a new chapter. Uh, but at the end of the day, I had 20 years with, a, with, with, with some great, great young men, uh, great families. We won a lot of lacrosse games. We were the winningest staff in Hopkins history. And, uh, you know, we created some great memories, and I believe we left it better than we found it. Hmm. Coach, let me follow up uh, with from Stan's questions. The first question he asked you, you know, just like an introductory, how, how you doing, how you feeling, and you answered, obviously, I'm doing well, you know, health-wise, et cetera. But at the same time, though, this is literally the first time in 30 years, Dave, that at this time of the year, you are not on the sidelines coaching a college lacrosse team. I know it's your passion. You were a great player. You were a great coach, of course. But literally, the first time in 30 years, Dave. So, again, I just ask you that question. How do you feel about that? after 30 years well i appreciate the kind words and the compliments and, and i would be uh, i wouldn't be it, there wouldn't be full transparency if i didn't tell you that my internal alarm clock has been going off for quite <laughs> some time um you know it is different you know usually uh you know i went from going 100 miles an hour to zero and uh you know again you can look at challenges you face in your life and these are the things that i taught my guys at hopkins and cornell um, and you hope you take your own advice. But, you know, when you're faced with challenges, those become opportunities if you handle them the right way. And, and that's how I've looked at this, Gary. Um, you know, sure, would I love to be on the sideline? Absolutely, positively. But you know what? It's not the case right now. Um, you know, we're in, 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 in an era where coaches are coaching against COVID more than they are their opponents. Um, I've been able to stay connected to the game very closely um, through, you know, the, the group I'm with at Legendary Sports Group. Um, We're going to talk spent, about that in just a couple of minutes. Great. Yeah. I, I spent some time on some other college campuses, watching their practices, helping those guys a little bit, helping uh, at practice with my son's team a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, of course, that internal alarm clock's going off, and you're used to being busy, busy, busy this time of year. Uh, but rather than dwell on not being busy, I, I, I tried to look at it as this is an opportunity for me to grow as a person, uh, grow as a coach, 
maybe be a better dad for uh, for a little bit and uh, to prepare for that next opportunity. What's the uh, the story about Nelson Mandela? They uh, he was incarcerated for I think 27 years, and when he got out, you know, they said, you know, how did you do it? How did you how, how did you manage? How did you deal with it? And he said, I didn't deal with it. I didn't manage. I prepared. And he prepared those 27 years for, you know, his presidency and, uh, you know, in a situation that changed our world. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's probably the best way for me to look at it. Yeah, that's a great thought, Dave. Um, let me follow up also on another thing from Stan. Stan uh, talked about your record, you know, kind of the early years, the middle years and the late years. And you talked about some of the challenges that you faced uh, you and your staff faced at Hopkins in the later years, quote unquote. But one thing that you didn't mention was the fact that Hopkins moved into the Big Ten, I believe in 2015 or 16, if I'm not mistaken. And I wonder, uh, and you know this better than anyone, you know, the schools in the Big Ten may not have been as advanced in lacrosse as Hopkins has, had been over the years, but they did have huge budgets funded by their football programs. We're talking about the Michigans and the Ohio States of the world, Penn State, et cetera. And I'm sure a lot of that money, some of that money bled over into the, into the lacrosse program, facilities, uh, you, know, you know, scholarships, all these types of things. My question is, how do you think that move affected Hopkins on the field, the culture of the lacrosse program, the fit for Hopkins in that conference? Well, you know, I, I think it's a, a matter of opinion for a lot of people. It's easy to say, well, Hopkins isn't like those other places. They're not like them physically from a, a size standpoint. Uh, they're not like them, you know, culturally. Um, they're, they're not like them in terms of location, you know, in terms of most are urban campuses, uh, I mean, rural campuses, and Johns Hopkins is an urban campus. You know, you know me well enough to know I've never been one to make excuses, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to start that now. Uh, I, 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 I was fully on board uh, with, uh, you know, President uh, Brody and then President Daniels uh, and the administration when the time came to either try and remain independent or find a conference. And, you know, no, no easy task there. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were involved. There was a blue ribbon uh, committee put together of alumni and faculty and some, some quite, some, some, quite uh, some very smart people. And the choice was made to, to join the Big Ten. And uh, I was fully in support of that. And I still support that to this day, you know, for Johns Hopkins to be successful having one bite of the apple um, and, and living off of your strength of schedule and, and you know, winning all those games, uh, you know, made it challenging to, to, to earn a bid in the NCAA and to have the opportunity to have that automatic qualification, which when we were there, um, we, we won the Big Ten twice and, and we're in it three times. Um, so, I, you know, it, it would be hard for me to say it was the wrong decision when Johns Hopkins – you know, has won two at the time when I left two of the last five uh, Big Ten championships and played in three of them. So uh, is it challenging? Sure. Are those other schools blessed with a ton of resources? A a absolutely. But every place has got its strengths and weaknesses. Talking to Coach Dave Petromala, uh, who is on the sidelines this season, but we're going to start talking about your, your position with Legendary Sports Group in just a second you're a good friend of bill belichick's i'm wondering if after you left hopkins have you had any heart to hearts with him about the next chapter in dave petromile's life yeah you know i've had those heart to, heart to hearts with a lot of people and you know i'm very grateful and thankful i've been blessed you didn't reach out to me and gary <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't. I didn't want to interrupt your uh, your busy schedules. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Know, you. I, I, again, I've been blessed, and I'm very grateful to have come across and uh, made friends and, and, and acquaintances and, and created relationships with some wonderful people. And uh, I did have a number of people who have found themselves in a similar situation as I am in right now. Reach out, um, share their thoughts, uh, their experiences. Um, share with me, you know, kind of the, the, the timeline of how they felt and they were sad and then, you know, upset and then missing it. And so I, I've, I've had the luxury 
uh, of some pretty special people uh, to offer me their, their experiences. Coach Belichick is obviously one of those. Um, he had that experience in Cleveland and uh, he's been wonderful, whether it's while I was at Hopkins or, or, or since um, he's been terrific. I've always, you know, I've always learned something every time that I, uh, I have a conversation with him. Uh, he's really taught me how important it is to be a great listener um, and always searching for better ways to be successful. And, uh, you know, during this, during this time period where I'm not on the field, um, you know, it's actually his advice that I'm following, which is utilize this time to, to watch, to listen, to learn. Um, you know, I think it was Mac Brown who I saw an interview with and he talked about how after he left Texas, he used his time as uh, an announcer to when he went to other teams practices to, to watch what they did. To, to, to learn about the, the, the talented young coaches out there, to see the different schemes that they were using. Uh, and clearly um, he watched, listened and learned, and that's benefited him. And I've tried to, to do that, uh, you know, kind of similarly. And, and that was coach's advice was to take this time and to use it wisely. So hopefully uh, I've done that. I want to ask you another question along that. And we, I promise we will get into talking about a legendary sports group, but Two coaches that I know of, one in baseball, one in football. Gary, help me real quick. The coach of the Dallas Cowboys now is with the Packers. McCarthy? Mike, 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 McCarthy. Mike McCarthy. I read that when Mike got let go by the Packers, one of the first things he did was start to study how he could get better at analytics because analytics are taking over a lot in all sports. And I read the same thing about Mike Matheny, that one of the first things he sought out when he was let go by the Cardinals was how, how he could get his knowledge of analytics up to speed. Have analytics hit the game of lacrosse to where that's something that you could maybe trend toward? Uh, you know, I, I think they're there and I think coaches are using them. I, I don't think they're being used or available at the same level. Right. Um, you know, but coaches are using offensive efficiency. Coaches are using, you know, defensive efficiency. You know, where does the face off? What role does that play? What, you know, what role does save percentage play? Where do you have to be to, to be in the top 10 or to be a national championship team? I, I would tell you, Stan, the thing for me, that I've spent the most time with is culture, okay. you know, and, and, and how important culture is and that five-star culture beats five-star talent. And if you have five-star talent and five-star culture, well, then you're in a pretty special you 10 place. stars. You get 10 stars. Correct. But there are a lot of these pro programs and, and, and some of these college programs that spend an awful lot of time with, you know, psychological evaluations of what, what kind of player, they've been successful with. So I've spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about our time at Cornell and my time at Hopkins, my time at Loyola as an assistant and thinking about those places and what the strengths and weaknesses of those places and what kind of young men were the right fit. What, what kind of young men were the ones that afforded us the opportunity to be successful at the highest level. And I really enjoyed you know, spending a lot of time on these cultural things. I've had conversations with, you know, coaches in the, at the academies, uh, coaches in the Ivies, and then obviously coaches in the ACC and Big Ten to just, you know, talk to them about, you know, what's important to them. You know, what are their core values or their pillars? Um, you know, what are the non-negotiables when you're recruiting a young man? And what do you think the most important characteristics or qualities are? Um, you know, like I said, coaches, Coach Belichick's always said how important listening is. So there's a lot of talented guys out there. And it's been, you know, I've been amazed at how many people are willing to talk to me about things now that I'm not a head coach at Hopkins. <laughs> but I've been able to gather a lot of information, listen to, you know, a number of podcasts, and then also think about the things we did well and didn't and how all this fits with us or with me and what I might like to do differently. And similarly, at the same time, at the next stop. 
Dave, let me start the conversation about the legendary sports group. Um, you have had a successful career, obviously, as a player, won a national championship. Stan alluded to the fact you're the only person to win a national championship as both a player and a coach. Um, so you've been successful. I'm sure you're going to be successful in your next venture. And the, right now, it's with the legendary sports group. Dave Cottle is involved. Brendan Kelly, the former owner of the Chesapeake Bayhawks, is involved. Tell us, and it's good local blood here. Tell us about this venture, what your role is, and what you're looking to do. Well, those guys have been great. The, the team at Legendary Sports Group has been a privilege and a pleasure to work with. Um, you know, they say timing is everything in life. And, uh, you know, they came along at, at, at the right time. And, uh, you know, I, I remember, um, you know, Brendan and Coach Cottle called me and said, you know, look, we, we'd like to sit down and talk to you and, uh, you know, about an opportunity. We own an event group. You know, and initially, you know, your first reaction is that's not what I want to do. I'm a coach. That's not what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, but you, you, you stop, you think about it, you know, and I think at that point you got to listen to everything, keep an open mind. So I went down and obviously I have a, a great relationship with Coach Cottle. I worked for him at, at then Loyola College, now Loyola University, um, have tremendous respect for him. And I did know Brendan um, peripherally through – you know, his kids and tournaments and obviously the Bayhawks. So I went down and it was a great chance for me to learn about a different leader uh, in, in Brendan Kelly. Uh, you know, he likes to think outside the box. Um, was great for me to have the chance to, to see things from a different perspective. And after sitting down, I went down and uh, we sat on the boat. We didn't even go out. We sat on a boat for a couple hours, had lunch, um, talked about their vision um, what they wanted to do, how they saw me fitting into that vision. Um, you know, it wasn't hard for me to decide, you know, at that time that this was a good move for me. Uh, it's kept me connected to the game of lacrosse uh, with the club coaches, uh, probably more so than, than ever before. So I've been able to develop some really nice relationships with these club guys who, as you know, are so integral in the recruiting process. I got to reconnect with some high school coaches uh, I'm still in touch with the uh, college guys. I'm still a member of the IMLCA board um, and still serve as the li liaison for the IMLCA to the rules committee. Um, and then I, I got to be a part of these events. And, you know, I said to myself, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to run events. And what I want to do is coach. And what they've allowed me to do is be a part of creating events where we do that where coaching is important. Uh, you know, we're trying to bring together with this five-star uh, elite lacrosse, uh, the best players in the country at certain age groups. Teach them what it means to compete. Teach them what it means to be a great teammate. Um, you know, and teach them the game and, and how it's coached and played at the highest level. You know, those are things that I was doing at Cornell and Johns Hopkins. So, you know, in some way, shape, or form, I've been able to, you know, stay true to my roots a little bit. Um, and yet still, you know, put on these events that uh, hopefully have been beneficial to legendary sports group. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, maybe the best part is I get to work with a great team with Coach Cottle and, you know, Lisa LaPlaca, Matt Florio and, and, and that group. And, and working for Brendan has really been uh, enjoyable. It's helped me see things from a different perspective as a leader and learn a, little, a different leadership style. So, so, Dave, viewers watching right now, I'm sure, are probably thinking, wait a minute, events, he's talking about events during COVID, right? How, are, are these virtual events or like real time? Like, what is it exactly? No, these are real time events. I know that may, be, that may be somewhat controversial for some. Uh, you know, I think for us, you know, we're, we're in the business of events and, and you know, look, to, to, to remain relevant and, and to remain productive, and, uh, you know, financially stable, you've got to put these events on. Um, we've, you know, our first goal is always to, to do everything, uh, you know, from a very safe and healthy standpoint. You know, Brendan and Coach Cottle have insisted on that. We've, uh, I think at all of our, our events, we've not only followed protocol, but probably gone above and beyond. Uh, but we're in a time, Gary, where, you know, for these young people, this is really challenging. I mean, shoot, I know how challenging it is for me to stay home. Yeah. Uh, you know, I came down with COVID a number of weeks ago and, you know, served my quarantine and it's miserable staying in the house that long. And these kids, 
you know, depression is at an all time high. Um, suicide is at, all, at an all time high, you know, in teenagers. So, you know, this is an opportunity for them to get out, uh, to, to play a sport they love, but, but to have an outlet. And at the same time, it's an opportunity for us to teach these young men the game, to coach them and, and hopefully better prepare them or help them to understand if they even want to compete at the next level. Dave Petromal is our guest. Dave, um, I think before we started taping tonight, they're going live on Facebook Live with this. You mentioned that the PLL, the Premier Lacrosse League, which is Paul Rabel's, the league that he started, he's partnered with the MLL, correct? Can you explain how that partnership is working out? Yeah, you know, I, inevitably, you know, uh, there, there, there were two leagues uh, and actually a third in the NLL, um, but there were two outdoor leagues and, you know, they were competing with one another and competing for, you know, the, the nation's best talent. And, uh, you know, the, the I should say not even the nation's, but the world's best talent, because there are players, you know, uh, from international spaces playing, um, you know, and, and when you have that, you know, are, are, are you good? Are you good or average because you're doing two things? Or if you do it together, are you great? You know, and I'm not sure our, our sport was ready for two leagues. I think it was actually good that it happened. I give Paul an awful lot of credit, um, you know, for – and he's got a lot of courage to do what he did. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I give the MLO credit for, for continuing to grind on. Um, but now you've got a league where you have the best players, you know, in the world that, that are now participating – under one umbrella, so to speak. Um, you know, there's been, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a draft for those players that, uh, you know, we're in the MLL. You know, it certainly bolsters the rosters of, of certain teams. Um, you know, and now you've got one league that can really put its best foot forward. Um, you know, and I, and I don't think that happens without the league, two leagues splitting and then coming back together. So um, I think it was a good thing for our sport. Uh, that, you know, they've kind of come back together. I know the PLL has worked to uh, keep some of the, uh, some of the, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, not the traditions, but some of the parts of the MLL, some of the coaches, uh, obviously the players, uh, name. Uh, so I, I think it's been really, uh, it, it's been a good thing for our sport. The other day when I called to book you and ask you if you would sit down with Gary and I, uh, I, I asked you a question about something to do with the legendary sports group. You're working with all the best juniors and seniors that are coming into the college, into their college world. And I said, is, is part of this that you could position yourself to really know these players when you get your next shot? And you said, you weren't cocky. You said, I know these juniors and seniors like the back of my hand right now. Uh, what kind of edge does that give you? Let's say you're somewhere next year. I won't name any schools, but uh, you're somewhere next year. Having worked with these players, does it give you a leg up a little bit or at least a foot in the door? Well, the exciting part would be to be, to be on a sideline again. The, the sad part or the disappointing part would be to leave the team at LSG, uh, who's been so great. But w what this has done um, is it's helped me to connect – in, in a actually much closer way almost right. with the recruiting these kids now you're coaching. right with the sophomores and the juniors in, in, in high school um, you know and I'm not bound by the same NCAA restrictions as I was as a coach so before you know I would go to a, a, a tournament I'd watch a kid and think the world of them you know and have to wait until you know the contact period arrived and then I could you know share with him our, our feelings on him. Now I can walk right over to him, put my arm around him, you know, introduce myself, tell him I watched him play. And, you know, hey, man, I thought you did a great job. You know, really was impressed. Um, you know, I can actually sit down with these kids at these tournaments that we're running, get to know them. Uh, you know, at our five-star event down at IMG with the 23s, I can't tell you how many families I got to sit down with at the, you know, in the uh, restaurant area, say hello, get to know them a little bit better. Um, 
So, you know, if in fact there is a next stop, which I, I do hope there is, um, I, I can tell you that I am, uh, I can say confidently that I am uh, clearly aware of, uh, you know, who the, who the better players are, um, you know, in order to select these five-star players, uh, we've had to evaluate film. So, you know, we spent the last three months uh, up leading up to December watching films of the best 2023s. Now we're on already started on the 2024s. So it's been, uh, you know, that's something I did when I was in college. So it, it's very similar. I love it. I enjoy it. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a great way for me to remain connected and maybe um, make sure that if the next step comes, uh, there, there, there isn't a step missed, that we're well prepared for it. Dave, I want to go back to the PLL, MLL situation for a minute. You know, it, it seems to me the sport of lacrosse is an interesting anomaly when it comes to the sports landscape of our country in that the college game seems to be the more popular level of the sport as opposed to pretty much all the other sports, NFL, MLB, NBA, NHL. And I'm wondering if you, and I'm not saying that the level of play isn't great in the pro level, obviously it is. Those players are playing at an extremely high level. But the question is, do you ever see it changing? Do you ever see the MLL, PLL, or the new PLL being more dominant than the college game from a national popularity standpoint? As a guy that was a college coach and hopes to be one again, you know, my, my, my uh, you know, I'm in favor of the college game remaining the pinnacle of our sport. And, and that's what it's been uh, for so many years. There really wasn't a, a, a true professional outdoor league. So the only place fans could go to see lacrosse at the highest level, other than the international games, which were only held every four years was the college game. So the college game has become entrenched in, uh, you know, in our, uh, in, 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 our, in our sport. Uh, the other part is, you know, with the college game, you get, you, you get to root for the, these players, you get to know them as a, from a fan's perspective for not one year or for two years, but for, for four years. You know, you're reading about them now in high school when they're being recruited and committing to, to a certain school. And then you're following them all through, you know, their recruitment, their commitment, and then, then their four years of college. Uh, so that the time that they are at these places, you know, the fan bases become very connected with them. I'm not so sure at the pro level, there's that same connectivity. Um, you know, I, I also, I will say you, you are absolutely right. The, the highest level of our game is professional lacrosse. I, I watch it and I am absolutely amazed whether it's the indoor league in the NLL or the PLL or MLL. Um, the level of play is absolutely fantastic. But, you know, pro lacrosse is not as established as college lacrosse is. There's some that would tell you there are high areas, high school lacrosse is more mm -hmm. followed than pro lacrosse. And, and, and what Paul is doing with the PLL and what the guys with the MLL have, have done is they're pioneers. And, you know, at pro football wasn't the, 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 the you know, the, the, the big boy on the block for many, many years. It took a long time for that to, to, you know, to transpire and happen. College football was the game. You think back to, you know, the old Franklin Field when Penn and Navy and all those teams were yeah. just tremendous. It took time for those <laughs> pro league, that pro league to, to kind of catch on and establish itself. And then for people – to grow familiar and connected with it. And, you know, the hope is that, uh, you know, the pro league continues to grow, develop, and folks do become more connected to it. But again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a traditionalist and I'm, I'm a college lacrosse guy. So uh, I'm a big fan of the pro league. I, I would, would be interested to see what it's like to coach in it maybe, but nonetheless, I'm a, I'm, I'm a college guy. So hopefully the college game continues to grow and develop and, uh, and be the pinnacle of our sport. Hey, Dave, let me ask you one more and then I'll turn it over to Stan to basically close it out. You know, if and when that next offer comes for you for a college head coaching job, and I know you have a lot more to give, Dave, you're young, you're only 53, 54 years old. I know you've been on the sidelines for 30 years, but you got a lot more to give. My question is, 
would what kind of program would appeal to you? Would it be a more established program that has traditions in place that you can maybe even improve upon? Or would you want to take over a fledgling program and maybe kind of build it from the ground up and develop your own legacy in that program? Sure, that's a great question. And certainly I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about that almost every day and or almost every morning I wake up and every night I go to bed. Um, you know what, I'd be very open to, to listening to, to anything. Um, you know, I've never been a part of a major athletic department or a larger athletic department. You know, it was very interesting for me to go through or to watch my sons, my twins go through the recruiting process and see what these larger schools are like, these larger athletic departments and the things they have to offer, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I've also been a part of, you know, a, a middle range school at Cornell University, uh, which is a great Ivy institution, and then smaller institutions like, like, like Hopkins and, and Loyola. Um, you know, I would be open to, 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 to any size. I, I, there are some things for me that would be non-negotiables, and it would be, you know, I would want to have a partnership with the administration, whether it's to help build it, rebuild it, or or, or continue uh, a rich history, conti continue that history. Um, I would want to be somewhere where at some point in time, there was an opportunity for the young men that were a part of that program to compete for and win a conference and a national championship. Um, and I want to be somewhere where lacrosse is important. Uh, I've, I've always been at places where it's been a priority. Um, it's certainly a big part of my life. Uh, but I'd certainly be open to looking at maybe something that's physically different in, in a different place, uh, maybe more rural than urban. Uh, but nonetheless, I'd, I'd like to be at a place where we, you know, if I'm a part of it, we have an opportunity and the young men that are there have an opportunity to compete at the highest level of our sport. I mean, ultimately, it's uh, there's there, there's nothing like being a part of a program and a culture uh, that's a championship culture. It certainly, it, it breeds itself and, and, and grows these young men to, to, to be even more successful when they leave. And I'd like to be a part of something like that. Gary stole my, my next to last question. So I'll, I'll just ask you, <laughs> does location matter at all to you? I mean, you'd go anywhere. You know, the challenge for me would be my boys, um, but they know what's in my heart. Um, we've had the conversation uh, so no, I'm, I, I would go, you know, pretty much anywhere. I mean, obviously my kids and my, my girlfriend who I live with, uh, their opinions would be very important to me and they play a role in the decision. But for me personally, as long as it's not Alaska, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm okay with going pretty much anywhere. All right. Two, two quickies. Uh, one of the things that happened to you at Hopkins, and I know you can't control who you're competing against you had charlie toomey come in at loyola you had john tillman come in at maryland and you had sean nadlin come in and really improve the prospects at towson no disrespect to bill over there but your, your thoughts on those three coaches how much respect you have for them uh, you know i have great respect for him i mean uh, he, uh he, my former assistant and, and good friend bob benson now is an assistant at the university of maryland uh, a very strategic and great hire, in my opinion, for them. Um, you know, I'm proud to say we were, I think, the one school that had a winning record versus Maryland. And I think that I say that uh, to, to maybe provide some, uh, you know, background as to how successful they've been. Um, John Tillman has gone there. Uh, he's built off of what Dave Cottle was building. Uh, if you think back to you know, Dave Cottle's last few years, and you look at the pro league and how many of those young men that Dave Cottle coached at Maryland have not only performed at a high level in the pro league, but have had longevity, you know, so coach Cottle really started to get that thing rolling and John, you know, built on top of that. He's yep. done a tremendous job recruiting. Um, I think he's done a great job finding young men that are great fits for the university of Maryland uh, you know, and clearly his record uh, and then winning a national championship speaks for itself. So they've done a good job. Sean Nadalin played for me at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I recruited him. I remember sitting in Rush Henry at a high school with him. 
Uh, he was one of the first guys that came to, a, a, to, to our meeting with a, a shirt and tie. Um, Sean's an all-world player, uh, a great defensive mind. I think from a, a personality standpoint, a really good fit for Towson University. I think he identifies well with their guys and where those guys come from. Uh, and he's done a great job there. And then Charlie Toomey has, has done wonders. Um, you know, I was an assistant at Loyola for a year, so I know it well. Uh, the institution is very committed to, to the sport of lacrosse. And I think Charlie culturally has found out what belongs in a Loyola locker room. You know, I, I, I spoke with his assistant and uh, Mark Van Arzel, who's a terrific coach. And I wanted to know, you know, what, what, what's your program like? What's, what's, what's Charlie Toomey really good at? Um, you know, again, it's about that watch, listen, and learn stuff. And uh, I think he understands Loyola University very well uh, as, a, as an alum. I think he understands what kind of player he wants to coach there and what kind of player can be successful there. I mean, they're, clearly, their they're, they're, uh, you know, X's and O's are great. And you got Matt Juan, who's another Loyola alum. Who, so you've got two guys that are extraordinarily passionate yeah. about that place. So, you know, the state of Maryland has got some, uh, you know, pretty darn good teams right now and some pretty darn good coaches. My last question for you, and, and I haven't used any media outlet that I've had to talk about this person. We lost somebody, the three of us, that we all knew pretty well in the last year, and that's Jerry Smith, who owned PJ's Pub over there at 333 North Charles Street. Gary, when I gave Gary his first start in the media locally, I said, Gary, I'm going to give you an opportunity to go out and sell to make me money so I can pay you a little bit. <laughs> Gary brought in Jerry Smith as a sponsor, and Jerry and I became friends for close to 35 years. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, came down with Lou Gehrig's disease. Your thoughts on, on Jerry personally and what PJ's meant to, that, meant to the, the, the fabric of John Topkins' life? Well, no doubt Jerry Smith was a part of the fabric of the Johns Hopkins and Baltimore community. Uh, and certainly PJ's Pub was a, 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 as a local establishment uh, for the college students. And quite frankly, for the faculty to go eat lunch, for the parents to go to after games, um, it was also a part of that, that same fabric. Um, I happened to, to, to be one of the last people that had a chance to visit Jerry. Uh, before he passed, and I went to uh, his home uh, over uh, right in the Charles Village area. And uh, very sad to see uh, a man that lived his life. His life was about communicating. Talk Jerry, yeah. Jerry loved to talk. Jerry loved to talk about basketball. Yeah. Uh, he loved his Duke Blue Devils. <laughs> um, he, he, he loved not as much, not as much as he loved Hopkins. Hopkins no, and, and there was no bigger fan of, of Johns Hopkins athletics, and in particular Johns Hopkins lacrosse. Uh, you know, when we won our two national championships, uh, we purchased ring a ring for Jerry Smith, and the reason for that is is is, is simple. Um, he loved our guys. Uh, he looked out for our guys. You know, and in today's day and age. You know, the, the whole uh, bar scene and those kinds of establishment can be a bit controversial, you know, and obviously times change. Uh, but for me, during my time at Hopkins, the one thing I knew was when my players were there, I knew they were being looked after and they were safe. And if they didn't handle themselves in an appropriate fashion, you know, I would click, quickly get that phone call, uh, which thankfully was few and far between. Uh, but Jerry Smith was... Uh, a lover of sports, uh, a lover of Johns Hopkins, uh, a lover of the lacrosse players. Um, he created a, a home for people to go when they came back. Um, and you know what? And before the Cordis Lacrosse Center was built, there really wasn't a place to do that. Homewood Field was that place. Yeah. So Jerry provided, you know, that gathering spot. And uh, he truly was uh, – he loved to communicate, and it was so sad to see a disease that took his ability to do what he loved most, which was connect with people, and uh, just, a, just a wonderful person and uh, was a great friend. 
Yeah, he, he, he is missed. Uh, and he, he sort of was under the radar to a lot of people in our sports community, but very important. I'm glad we could yeah. share that, Dave. Well, thank, hey, thanks, hey, for, thanks for bringing him up and honoring him that way. I know there are a lot of people that will be thrilled to know that, uh, you know, his memory still lives on. Well, he was a good Absolutely. friend to all of us. Hey, Go ahead, hey Stan. Gary. Yeah, let me let me slip one in now. Now yep. that we're uh, strolling down memory lane for a second, Dave, I've never told you this, Stan. I don't think I've ever told you this either. But I moved to Baltimore in 1987. I've been here now for about 34 years, Stan. I met Stan that year, 1987. Uh, Dave, I took an apartment at the Marylander, St. Paul sure. and University Parkway. Yeah. Literally two blocks from Homewood Field. Okay. I grew up in Miami Beach, Florida. I never even heard of the sport of lacrosse until I moved to Baltimore, okay? 1987, I'm living at the Marylander and I'm investigating my surroundings and I walk down University Parkway on a beautiful April afternoon and there's Homewood Field and there's a big crowd and there's a big game going on and I really had no idea what it was about. And so I ended up going in, I bought a ticket and I watched my first lacrosse game ever, okay? You were playing. That's the last ticket. That's the last ticket he ever bought for any event. Pro, pro, probably so, Dave. You, you, you were playing as I'm, as I'm sure you know. Great. Was a sophomore season. that year. Sophomore national championship. I didn't know about the sport, Dave. I swear to God, I didn't know about lacrosse. I go and I watch the game. I'm not even looking at a program, Dave. Okay, but I notice this guy playing defense for the team in blue, and I'm thinking to myself, who's that middle linebacker? playing defense for Johns Hopkins and you single-handedly actually turned me on to this sport. And since then, I must tell you, I love lacrosse. Yeah, I'm a I fanatic. I go to as many games as I can. I do the play by play for the America East conference, UMBC. I've learned to grow in love with the sport and I really trace it back to that day, Dave. And that's no joke. Your team and your performance, that stadium, that school, was the beginning of it all. And I really appreciate that and thank you for it. Well, you're, you're awful thoughtful and kind to, to say that. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure you're not exaggerating just a bit, but nonetheless, no, it, it, it is a great sport. Um, you know, the Maryland community is a great community for the sport of lacrosse. It's, uh, you know, they're passionate about it at the youth level, the high school level, the collegiate level. Um, you know, there's great, lacrosse traditions within the state, uh, within the, the Baltimore area. Um, so, you know, we all found, we all came to, to, to love the game in a different way, but I think at the end of the day, we're all very blessed to be a part of a sport that's a pretty spectacular one. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave Petromala. Continued good luck with Legendary Sports Group. And uh, when you get that second chance, you'll come on and do uh, the Zoom with us again, okay? I look forward to it, Stan and Gary. Thanks so much for having me. Great to see you guys again. Stay healthy. All right. Thank you, Dave. Same to you. Bye-bye. Coach Dave Petromala and Gary Stein. I'm Stan the Fan. Press Box Live is brought to you by C3 American Exteriors. Go to their website at c3america.com to get a brand new roof for just the cost of your insurance deductible. Ross Grimsley and I, Monday night, will have former O skipper Dave Tremblay on. Thank you for stopping in. We'll see you soon. Bye, guys.